Well, the Utah Geologic Survey's Paleontology Group has been studying the Cedar Mountain Formation for the last dozen years. And one of the things we've done with the Cedar Mountain Formation, these early Cretaceous rocks, is subdivide them into a number of units. And right here is one of our thickest sequences of the lower unit, the yellow cap member of the Cedar Mountain. And if we look up at this big escarpment on the southern skyline, Right down at the base, you see some little blue slopes and then a red sandstone interval. And we're basically standing on that sandstone interval right here. We're using that gravelly red iron stained sandstone to mark at this location where the Cretaceous Jurassic boundary is. But if we look at this beautiful exposure, nice steep exposure that's been well studied, that red interval is the base of the section, the yellow cat member. There's a little break halfway up the slope that is a calcrete, a carbonate unit. And it's the first carbonate we see in this sequence of rocks uh, within the Cedar Mountain Formation as we go up. And from that point up, we see lots of carbonate. As we go up above that, the next interval up below the sandstone cliff, a lot of it in this area is lacustrine. That is, they represent lake and pond deposits. We see fossil fish in those beds, lungfish, freshwater spiny sharks, freshwater turtles, crocodilians, and on the shorelines above and below, dinosaur tracks, uh, and at the top, that's where we have the level of Utah Raptor, Gastonia, Cedarsaurus, a number of very good dinosaurs are known from just below that sandstone cliff as the lake retreated again. The sandstone cliff we call the Poison Strip Sandstone, named for outcrops just about a mile south of here. That unit splits the Cedar Mountain in half. It was referred to years ago as the middle sandstone of the Cedar Mountain. And then if we look over here, look to the west, we can see that sand coming down low in the slope because it's sloping to the north toward the Book Cliffs. And at the very top of that exposure, we have a little sandstone. The interval of shale between that sandstone ledge and the sandstone at the top is the Ruby Ranch member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. This lower stuff may be some of the earliest Cretaceous in North America. The upper stuff has generally been dating at about 105 million late early Cretaceous. And the sandstone at the top, right at the very top, is the beginning of the Dakota Formation. And as we look north, the Dakota Formation, all the way up through the highest cliffs we can see to the north, we have exposures of upper Cretaceous. So this little interval down here of only about 300 feet or so thick is equivalent in time, it represents about 25 million years with breaks to this vast thickness that extends here from the Dakota across the valley and all the way up through the Book Cliffs, the upper Cretaceous. But we've been focusing on this thin interval of rock representing a lot of time and a big chunk of Utah's story. This is where, right in here, is where we made the initial discovery of the Dolings bone, bone bed. And what we find in here, through this whole flat here, are isolated teeth, which one of the first things that caught our eye, broken pieces and isolated bones, and little ossicles, the little bones in the skin of armored dinosaurs. Well, I've been actually coming out here since 2007, and uh, the, I, I guess that was the first year we come out here to Dolings Bowl to dig up dinosaurs. Uh, Donda Blue and Scott Madsen have found a couple of sites over here, and it's actually right across the wash here, this is Scott's place. And I dug over there and found a iguanodont jaw, a big old iguanodont jaw in 19, or, or 2007. And, you know, we've passed up through here all through those years since then. Uh, and I think last year, after a little more flooding, it had exposed two really big bones about right in this area here. One was a, a sternal, which is one of the big chest bones on a sauropod, and then there was a, a, a pubis over here in this hole, and it turned out there was a couple of nice verts in there, and a rib and a few things. And so we, we knew we had, and then we started digging in, we knew we had, we had an associated dinosaur at this point, so it was really quite exciting. And then we found a nice tibia that year, but look at this, 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 this femur, we have some bone we haven't been able to identify up here. This is some really complex bone down here. We don't know what it is yet. So, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. 
Because when I found it, I found it like right here or someplace, you know. But the wall, you see how these walls here was about right there, you know, going up. <laughs> so I could just see part of it. My name is Laurie, I'm from, I'm from England, and I'm just volunteering here just to help, well, give me a bit of experience, to be honest. I'm an archaeologist, so I'm not really used to this kind of excavation work, but it's uh, been good. We tend to, to get here about 8.30 and then work through with probably a little break during the day uh, till maybe about 5.36. It depends how cool it is. If it's too hot, then we tend to get a lot, a lot more exhausted quick, quicker. Um, so you try to get as much done in the cooler part of the day as possible. I like um, the idea of just sort of coming out somewhere, not knowing anybody, and just having to get on with it, meet new people, do some pretty cool excavation work on dinosaurs, which, let's face it, everyone loves. Um, you know, you, I leave with a little bit of um, a bit more knowledge than I had before. So, my name is Jessica Grenader, and uh, I'm from Houston, Texas. And I I came out here. My professor uh, emailed Jim and s wanted to know if he had any opportunities for students and he could come out here. And I was really excited. I had no idea what to expect. They showed me the ropes, like how to plaster the bones and how to dig with a flat surface and keep it clean. I'm really careful because I just got here. Um, this, it might take a day and if stuff starts showing up like this bone or these bones over here, because you try to uh, trench around it and get um, a deep like section so we can jack it over it and put plaster and take it out safely. But when you run into bone like this, it's, you're going to have to make a wider area, you're going to have to find out if it's connected to something over here. Or, so it really just depends. Oh, every day I found bone. Uh, not always big bones, sometimes it's little like chunks over here that aren't really connected to anything. And um, I haven't found a femur or anything, but, uh, but you find bone a lot once you figure out what it looks like at least. <laughs> the bone is really fragile when you first find it, so the glue is... Um, it's really like you drop it on and when it dries, it um, hardens the plastic inside. And so it keeps the bone from crumbling and, and makes it safer to work around it. Before the bones are jacketed and collected, they are mapped onto a grid sheet so that the position and orientation of the bones is documented. Here, Jessica and I use a metal grid to aid with the mapping. She uses a plumb bob to mark the ends of the bones so that I can draw them onto the map. These maps are then compiled into a single map that can provide valuable information about how the bones were deposited. After a bone is discovered in the rock, the top surface is uncovered, just enough so that the aerial extent of the bone can be seen. The bone is then pedestaled so that a protective plaster jacket can be put around the bone. Here, a large femur is being readied for jacketing. Layers of damp paper towels are placed over the bone as a separator to protect it from the plaster. Strips of burlap are soaked in plaster of Paris and placed over the bone and rock to form a jacket. After the plaster has hardened, the pedestal can be undermined and the jacket flipped over. The same process is then used to seal the bottom of the jacket. It is now ready for transport back to the lab where it can be extracted from the rock. Nope, we're done. This thing's done. So here we are back at the Utah Geological Survey. Um, our lab's here in our uh, core research center. Uh, so this is one of the jackets from Doling's Bowl. And as you remember from the parts in the field, we will isolate the bones and put a jacket over the top. In this case, there were several bones um, that were so close together that we weren't able to isolate them individually. Um, so we got around as best we could, and then what you're seeing here is the top side from the field. And so we jacketed this in the field, made it into kind of a mushroom. Then 
we flipped it over and we put the top jacket on. So each one is mapped on the grid and has its own um, distinct number. So this one is Dolings Bowl, Gary's Island, number 69. So we have a log sheet and a map that has this on it. Now what we're going to do is flip it over so we can cut that top jacket off and then work our way in from um, the bottom side. Now it's just a matter of bringing this back into our lab and slowly removing the rock here. So this is the jacket that we just opened up yesterday and so uh, worked the rock down. You can see a few things coming out. So we have a big flat bone here. This is probably part of an ischium, which is part of the pelvis. Um, and here's a vertebra here and a few other little midnicks coming out here. We only got four of its toes, the claws, and the tips of the toes, with metatarsals. There's going to be one more little one down in here. I haven't got to it yet. And so that would make this the tibia. So that's what we call articulated when it's all together. Like this, it's very rare. After the fossils are prepared in the lab, they're ready for scientific study and display. All the fossils collected by the Utah Geologic Survey on public lands are placed in the permanent collections of the Natural History Museum of Utah. Here are some of the bones we have collected from the Cedar Mountain Formation that have been loaned by the Natural History Museum of Utah for exhibit at the John Wesley Powell Museum in Green River, Utah.